Do your preschool or pre-K students need help learning how to count and develop number sense? In today's episode of Elevating Early Childhood, I'm sharing my top five hands-on, fun and engaging math activities for small group time. But first, let me ask you a question. Has this ever happened to you? You're trying to do a small group activity, but your students just aren't feeling it. They're looking at their classmates to see what they're doing, and you're left trying to figure out how on earth you're ever gonna teach them anything if they won't pay attention. Every good pre-K teacher knows that the way to get kids to pay attention is to capture it with fun and playful methods. Now, if they're not listening at circle time, we know that all we have to do is bust out the puppets, some songs, and really use those voices during a read aloud. But if they're not listening and paying attention during small group, you've got a big problem. So what can you do about it? First things first, you're going to want to make sure that your small groups don't compete with your free choice centers. If your small groups are competing with centers like blocks and dramatic play, you're fighting a losing battle. If possible, have a dedicated small group time in your schedule every single day. Now, in this episode, I'm not gonna get into all the details of the purpose of small groups, how they work, or how to manage them, because episode 24 of this podcast was all about small groups. So if you wanna learn how to set up, organize, manage small groups, then you're gonna to wanna to go and check out episode 24 first. So on to those activities, are you ready? This activity that I have set up here for our listeners, I have six small rubber ducks. I got them from the dollar section at Target a couple of years ago. And they're small. You can see they fit. They're very small, right? They're not choking hazards, but they are still not your full size rubber duck. Then I have a small bowl and it's got just like a half inch of water in it right? And this is a plastic bowl that I also got from Target. And then I have a dice. Now this is a foam dice. I get these from oriental.com because they are very sturdy. They're foam so they don't hurt and they don't make noise, right? So if somebody were to throw one in the air and it hit someone on the head, it wouldn't hurt. It's also soft and it doesn't uh, make any noise when it's rolled. So a big bonus in the early childhood classroom. So I have one dice six rubber ducks, a bowl with about a half inch of water. The levels of the water in there are very, very low because if it spills onto the table, then I won't cry. <laughs> and I have the whole thing in a tray here in front of me. And so the way this activity would work, I would gather my students in a small group and they're going to sit around the bowl and the ducks and they're going to take turns rolling the cube and then counting the corresponding number of ducks. Now, if I sat them down and I just said, we're going to be learning how to count today, they don't care. But if I set out a bowl of water and little ducks, you better believe they care. And now the person who rolled the six gets to count one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if you're listening along, I just placed six rubber ducks into my bowl of water. And now my little ducks are swimming around. And now if you wanted to teach them, you know, five little or six little ducks went out to play over the hills and far away, something like that, they could sing that as well. Now that child's turn is over, and so that child can take the ducks out, because taking them out is just as fun as putting them. And then the next child has a turn. Now you could also do it where each child has a little bowl, and you could roll the dice, and then you could kind of control how they count together the number of dots. Now one, two. So now this person rolled the number two, and they can put two ducks inside. Let me tell you all the things they're learning when they do this. First of all, even if kids haven't had much exposure to numbers and counting before or one-to-one -one correspondence, they learn really quickly that six is more than two. The kid who rolled a six got to put all the ducks in the bowl and the kid who rolled a two 
only got to put a few ducks in the bowl. So now you can talk about quantities of numbers. Who had more? Did Francisco have more ducks than Juan? Juan rolled a two and Francisco rolled a six. Who has more? So this is a super fun game. Let me tell you the first time you play this with your kids, you are going to see such interest from the children. Actually, if you do this and you have other kids in the room with you, which you will because you have one small group, there's other kids kids in the room, they're all going to come over and they're going to want to turn. This is how you set up excitement. You say, oh, that's wonderful. When it's your turn to come to group, you can roll the dice and you can put the ducks in. And so now they're looking forward to coming to your small group instead of running from you when it is small group time. This is a great one-to-one -one correspondence activity. And I keep it in the tray because you can see as they take the ducks in and out, there does get a little bit of water is splashed because the ducks do have this little hole in the bottom that attracts water. So I just like to keep it in a tray and everyone can have a turn. I've done it with a much larger bowl and with full-size rubber ducks before. But this activity is one that we did multiple times over the course of the year. And I would leave it when I was absent for substitutes because I knew that my kids would pay attention and be engaged if they were uh, doing this activity and it was review for them. I never wanted my subs to be doing introduction of new things. So I had them doing review and they love this game and they were so much better behaved for it. Certain kids are getting certain things out of this activity, right? So some kids are getting that one-to-one -one correspondence counting each item with one touch for each word said, right? One, two, three. And other kids might be getting something else from it. Maybe they're getting turn taking, right? Sharing, we have to share the dice. We have to wait for our turn, self-regulation. They're not ready for the whole one-to-one -one thing yet. And that's okay. Because if they need to work on self-regulation, if they need to work on turn taking, those are all things they're gonna need for the rest of their life. So it's okay for them to have exposure to this math concept while they're learning other things that are just as important. Super fun activity. Put this at the top of your must do list. Okay, so next up, I have a super easy activity that doesn't require any paper or very little prep. And I have it organized on this square tray just because I really like these trays and the colors they come in. It is not required for this activity. It also looks better on the screen than just a white background. Where did I get these square trays? Because I know you'll ask probably on Amazon. So I will put them in my Amazon storefront and link them for you if you like them too, um, but not required for this activity. I also have a little basket of mini erasers. People always ask me what I do with my hundreds and hundreds of mini erasers, my massive collection. Collection. And the answer really is anything. I like to use them all the time. I just have so happen to have in this particular basket snowflakes and snowmen. But the reason I like mini erasers is because I can change up the manipulative, in this case, mini erasers, I can change them up by theme. So I have hearts and I have pets and I have candy canes and I have pumpkins and you name it, I have them. So whatever theme you're doing, you can change up your mini erasers and I get the mini erasers from Target. And um, now you have what seems to be to the kids a completely different activity. I also have on this tray a dice, again, just like in the previous activity, these are foam. I get them from oriental.com. And it says on the, the dice funexpress.com, but I'm pretty sure I got these from oriental, but whatever. They're foam, they're soft, whatever. And then I have a cup. I actually have two cups here because I wanted to show you two options. This is a small clear shot glass. It's plastic from the Dollar Tree. And obviously it holds fewer mini erasers. And then this is a little, what we like to call in the US, a Dixie cup. Dixie is a brand name. These are just little tiny paper cups like you might use at the dentist's office. And they're a little bigger than the shot glass and they're paper. And then I also have some gator grabbers. These are not from the dollar store. These are from, I believe, learning resources. And they're just little alligators but they have these little teeth. So when they're squeezed, they're tweezers basically, when they squeeze them, they can pick things up with them and put them in their cup. So it just adds a little fine motor. I like to add a lot of fine motor to my math games. So here is how you would do this activity. First, you decide what size cup you wanna give your kids. I'm gonna use the clear cup because it's smaller and 
you can give them each a tray or you can do this in, you know, where there's just one basket and each kid has their own cup. I'm just using the tray to make it look more appealing on the screen for you. It's not necessary. So the way it works is a child rolls the dice, right? And the child rolled a four. And so now they're going to pick up and put one, two, three, and four into their cup, right? And then they just keep rolling and counting and putting mini erasers into their cup until the cup is full. And when the cup is full, they dump it out, start again. <laughs> now, if you were gonna do this where each child just had a cup and there was a shared basket of manipulatives, then when the cup is full, you could say that person is the winner, but I really try to avoid those types of games with four-year-olds because they really haven't developed that sense playing competitive games like that yet. It's just, it's too foreign to them and they don't respond well to it, generally speaking. And if you want the game to go on for longer, use the bigger cup. Next up, we have a ice cube tray game. And yes, this is indeed an ice cube tray. It came from Walmart a few years ago and it was double this size, but it's that really flexible um, silicone material so I just cut it in half and now I have two 10 frames right talk about thinking like a teacher right I was so proud of myself when I found that and cut it in half but this game is one that we play all year long right and again some kids get something one thing out of it and other kids get something different I've got the gator grabbers again right these little tweezers here they come in a lots of um, colors too and they're just the right size for those little tiny hands and they're very, very sturdy. They can withstand a lot of abuse. And the way it works is I have a couple of different manipulatives pictured on the screen, but pom-poms are my favorite way to play it because they're cheap. They come in a lot of fun colors. Sometimes they're sparkly and some have swirls and all that stuff. And so the way I like to play it is each child gets an ice cube tray, right? So let's say I have a group of five kids. I would need five ice cube trays. And the great thing about ice cube trays is they're super cheap. And I don't worry so much if there's 10 of them or not to make the 10 frame, but this just so happened to be the one I grabbed. You can find um, ice cube trays at any old dollar store. The way it works, once again, I know you're not gonna be shocked, but is they roll the dice and then, in this case, we rolled a three. We're gonna fill that many slots in our ice cube tray. Let me tell you, this seems like the simplest game on the planet. And you might be thinking, Vanessa, that doesn't sound very fun. But let me tell you, you can change up the manipulatives. The novelty that you're adding to this activity is you're giving a dice. This is something they have, they can hold in their hand and throw. You've got three dimensional objects they can touch and feel in the pom-poms right? You've added some fine motor to this that really requires concentration for kids to pick these up and put them into the tray. When their tray is full, right? So they're going to take turns rolling and filling their trays. So what I usually do is I have one tray per child in the small group and we take turns passing the dice. And when they're done, they dump it out and we and they can start over. We're not competing against each other because again, four-year-olds have a big problem with that. They're just not developmentally ready, usually, typically, to understand how competitive games work. And that's why it ends up in tears and tantrums 99% of the time. So another thing I like to do is, like I said, we play this all year, but the pom-poms get boring. So then I bring out mini erasers. And I told you I had um, hearts and now we have a Valentine theme um, game. So let's say if we rolled a three, now we're going to take three mini erasers. Here we go. And we just keep playing until our tray is full. And so just think of all the possibilities with all the mini erasers out there. You can change this up for any holiday. I also use my counters from my math center. So the teddy bears fit in here, all the little farm animals. You can put almost anything in here. And once we've done this together in small group several times, it becomes an independent practice activity and I just change out the manipulatives to go with our theme. Next up, we have a super fun game. When you play these types of games, 
your kids will come flocking to small group. So right here, if you're watching along with us, um, I'll describe it for the listeners. This is an empty tissue box. We like to call these Kleenex boxes in the US, but that's a brand name. So it's a tissue box. It's a square and I've taken the tissues out and then where the tissue would usually come out, now there's a big hole. So I have used my monkey mouth from my Feed the Counting Games bundle. And I have put the monkey, I've just cut him out, printed him on cardstock, cut him out, and then cut the hole for his mouth and taped him to the front of the Kleenex box. And now I've taken some banana erase, not erasers, I'm sorry. These are banana counters from my fruit counting set that I have in my math center or I use in my math center. You don't have to have bananas. I do this activity quite often with yellow pom-poms. Remember, I love to use pom-poms because they're cheap and they're quiet, but I just happen to have these bananas, so I'm gonna use them. Again, we have a dice and we have gator grabbers. Now, there's a couple of ways to play it. The simple way is just to, and I have it pointing towards you just so you can see it, but when I have the kids play, it's here it's flat and they're feeding the monkey bananas through his mouth that way. But for purposes of our viewers, I'm gonna have him facing upwards. So let's say you roll the dice and let's say we roll three. And now I'm gonna use my gator grabbers and I'm gonna feed the monkey one, two, and three. How fun is that? That is so super fun. And I added, in the bundle, each of these, now you don't have to use them if you don't want to, but I added these cards. And so there's different representations of the number, right? So this one, and I also created an original chant for each of the animals. And it says, monkey wants a tasty treat. How many bananas can he eat? And this one says three. And so then we would feed him three. I also have the cards with the dice on them. So this one, same chant. We're always chanting. So we've got their mouths and their ears engaged, right? Because they're producing the chant and they're listening to the words and they're using their hands to grab the tongs and the bananas or the pom-poms. So many different ways to play. And we have also got the 10 frame here. I got fingers, 10 frame, uh, dice, and I think there's tally marks too. I just didn't put them in the pocket cube. This is a, if you're watching along, this is a pocket cube. I love these because you can just slip things in and out right here. These are just the cards that come with the counting games bundle. So this is super fun. I have all the animals. I can't remember all the animals, but there are so many. I know there's a giraffe, there's a unicorn, there's a ton of different versions of this game. And again, you don't need um, bananas. I used pom-poms for almost all of the different things in this bundle. And we'll put a link below this video in the show notes um, so you can find the Counting Games bundle if you're interested. If not, you can totally draw a monkey and attach it to a tissue box or any animal for that matter and use pom-poms and a dice and some tweezers and you will be good to go. Kids love this game. It really helps them with developing number sense, counting one to one, fine motor skills and all that good stuff. Next up is a really fun, simple game. Now, almost every early childhood classroom I've ever been in or visited or seen online has teddy bear counters, right? Usually they're in the math center and we use them for so many things in early childhood. And I have a, a little tub of teddy bears here. And then we also have, this is a paper bowl a disposable bowl. This is a compostable one. So it's kind of brown, which I like because it's a bear cave. <laughs> so what I did was I cut a little hole in the side of the bowl with scissors, right? And we've got our trusty cube or our dice again. Now you could also use a pocket cube. One thing I forgot to mention is if you're using a pocket cube, you can make your own dots to go inside the pocket cube. So if your kids aren't able to count very high, like they can't count past three with one-to-one, -one, then you're gonna put numbers or representations of numerals 
up to three only in the pocket cube. So you would have three sides that had the same. So the way you play this game, and it really pairs well with a book about hibernation or bears, um, but of course each child gets their own cave. There's a couple of ways to play it. I like to play it where each child gets their own cave because now we're working on counting and we're also working on storytelling in, in one of the versions I'm gonna show you. So let's say we rolled a three. And so the child is going to take three teddy bears and put them inside the cave. One, two, and three. And so we're gonna take turns rolling the cube and putting teddy bears in our cave. Another way to do it would be if the teacher wanted to do some story problems, right? And so the teacher could say, one day there were two little bears and they were out picking berries in the forest, but then they got cold and wanted to go inside their cave to warm up. One, two, and then along came their brother. He'd been lost in the forest. But finally, he found his way home and he went into the cave. How many bears are in the cave now? Let's count them, right? One, two, three. So now you can see we did like simple addition. Two plus one is three. And when some early childhood standards talk about addition in that way, that's what they're referring to. Very simple, easy story problems that don't involve any plus or minus symbols. So this is super fun. I think I have a blog post on this that I will link for you in the show notes. If you're watching along, the show notes are below the video. If you're listening, we will have the link to to um, this blog post about the bear cave on the blog. So just go to pre-kpages.com, listen, and you will find all the details. And last but not least is counting soup. This one is so simple. You're going to go, what? This is super simple. What I've done here is I've taken a bowl from the Dramatic Play Center and I've taken a spoon also from the Dramatic Play Center and I've got my trusty gator grabbers here and then I've got some mini erasers and I've got my dice. So using that magic number three again, that's the number of the day, the child is going to roll the dice and then they can use the gator grabbers to put three mini erasers into the bowl. One, two, three. Now they can choose the mini erasers they put in. It does not matter. I picked one of each just because that's me. Um, but whatever ones they want, they can put in their bowl and then they can pretend to stir it up. They're making counting soup and they can continue rolling the dice and adding mini erasers to their bowl. And of course, the purpose of these types of activities is really for one-to-one -one correspondence, for them to understand that each of these dots represents one thing, and hopefully if they are picking up the things and putting them in one at a time, they're gonna develop those number sense skills that one-to-one -one correspondence more quickly. You could also create a quick little chant, bubbly bubbly, nice and hot, cooking up counting soup in my counting pot, right? <laughs> Stuff like that. Just a real cute chant. I did this the other day with a group of preschoolers, one little guy in my group, who only wanted the heart mini erasers. And he kept saying, I'm making heart soup. Guess what? I didn't care. He was happy. I was happy that he was playing the game and practicing one-to-one -one correspondence skills. The choice of, of which mini eraser to use is super powerful to young children. So again, I have this on a tray only because it gives some visual appeal on the screen, not because it's necessary. They are super cool. I got a pack of these for very cheap. Again, I'll put the link in the show notes for you. So there you have it. My top five small group counting activities that you can do in your preschool or pre-K classroom to help your students develop counting skills and one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, if your students are not super engaged in these activities, I want you to think about a couple of things, right? First, think about is the activity too easy or too difficult? And the way you do that is by making sure that you're using your assessment data in your small groups. So you've assessed 
test all your children on their counting and one-to-one -one correspondence skills. And if you have students who demonstrate on that assessment that they're not ready for this, most young children, uh, three and four, are ready for these types of activities I just showed you, but you have some children who aren't, then the activity is too hard. Or if you're doing this with a group of children who already have strong one-to-one -one correspondence skills, maybe they moved on to much more difficult concepts, this could be too easy. So you really have to think about, are you using your assessment data to help you determine what activities to do in your small groups? Because we can't just do what looks cute. We have to rely on what the data is telling us as far as what our kids need in order to advance to the next skill level, right? So we're differentiating our instructions to help meet them where they're at and move them on to the next level. The next thing to consider is, is it too noisy in the classroom? And don't forget, if you're competing with popular centers like Blocks and Dramatic Play, it might be a really hard sell. Even super fun and engaging activities can lose their appeal when children in your group see their friends participating or engaging in activities that they are really highly motivated to do. So if at all possible, I like to keep small groups separate from center time. That doesn't mean all the other kids in the class need to be perfectly quiet. There are are things that they can do that are perfectly acceptable during your small group time. I just made sure that when I do small group, I'm located in a different area away from the other children. The other children are on the other side of the room with an assistant, of course, and they're engaging in activities that maybe aren't quite as loud as dramatic play in blocks, but they're still fun and engaging. So I would have, if I was doing math centers or math small group, I would have math type centers open in the other half of the classroom. So we might have the library center, the math books were available. We might have the computers open with math programs. We might have the math center open with math manipulatives for review. Um, all kinds of math things could be going on across the room. So that's it for now. I hope you got some great ideas that you can take back and use in your classroom right away to spice up your small group math activities. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, onward and upward. Music